I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. So good morning, I'm Dave. I pastor this place. It's great to have you. Uh, we're in a series called I Am. These are the I Am statements that Jesus made. Uh, they're all housed in the book of John. Uh, today, I am the door. Uh, I love this metaphor. I love this picture because that's how I think. But before I get started, I too want to wish you a happy Mother's Day, all you uh, ladies. And uh, actually, I want to wish all of you men happy Mother's Day too. And good luck to you because the goal is to be good all day long. Uh, I'm not sure I've ever accomplished that. And I'm one of those guys that is already a failure because as I stand before you today, I have yet to buy something for my beautiful wife. But I also want you to know she's not my mom. So I'm feeling, feeling a little put off by that one. Yeah. What's the deal? You know, in our family ministries area, speaking of doors, uh, we have some doors hanging on the wall. It was a series we did earlier. People wrote their children's names on that, and we've been praying for those uh, names ever since. I just want to encourage you, if your kids' names aren't up there or people you love, uh, you want prayer over, uh, go put their names on those doors because we'll be praying over them. <clears throat> it's amazing to live where we are right now as a church because lots of doors are opening for us. Uh, we just received an award from the uh, school district for our work at uh, Robertson and the things that we're doing uh, in the schools. We have adopted a school. We're having all kinds of fun. In the first service, we got to see a family that is a part of our buddies program. Uh, all be baptized. I mean, powerful. I had tears in my eyes. Uh, we've been asked, there was just a meeting a week or so ago <clears throat> of the school district asking us to adopt a middle school and a high school too, <clears throat> excuse me, which we're already doing Young Life, supporting Young Life, part of uh, Young Life leadership at both Wilson and Ike, but we're going to have meetings and talk what it looks like to serve. We say that a disciple loves God, loves people, and serves the world, and one of the ways we serve is we just show up and say, what we, can we do? We don't have any agenda. We aren't there to talk about uh, our faith or any of that. We just want to serve, and just serving opens incredible doors for us. Uh, again, about a week or so ago, because of all the violence in our city, the city manager met with us and, and just encouraged us to be praying around our community. And, and I have a meeting um, on Tuesday with the mayor uh, just to talk about what the faith community can do to kind of stem this, this trend of violence. And, and the thing that is amazing is that those are doors that are open that are almost miraculous and incredible because in today, uh, age where there's a separation be church, between church and state, to be invited as the church to come in and be start, part of the solution to the problem, I mean, that's just an amazing, amazing door to be open to us. Uh, the symbol is, is a wonderful symbol. I'm very visual in the way I think. I love the symbol of baptism. I mean, uh, Christianity is filled with these metaphors, these symbols, these pictures. I mean, again, it fits me perfectly. I know you know this, but no one actually died in that baptismal. <clears throat> they didn't actually die. It's just a symbol of dying to myself and being raised anew in Jesus. <clears throat> a week or so ago, we had communion. Eat a little cracker, drink a little juice. Nothing if you want to look at it from those perspectives, but the symbolism is so powerful that people just literally just churn inside making sure they're right before God before they eat that little cracker and drink that juice because of the symbol of what it represents. Around here, we often pray for people. So when I dedicate a baby or we're praying for somebody, I'll anoint them with oil. And Pentecost is, uh, the celebration of Pentecost is coming. And the, and the oil that we anoint people with is a symbol of the presence of the Holy Spirit. And what's interesting is I found an article this week that just describes the ingredients that are supposed to be in this oil. And I don't know if you've heard this or know this, and the reason that this is important is that if Jesus is a door and you walk through it, this is what you get when you walk through that door. So there's myrrh in that oil that we anoint people with. And that is a, a resin from a briar, and it represents humility. 
Uh, God specified that the myrrh be used in the anointing oil, and it had to be the kind that just flowed by itself. So in other words, you couldn't cut it and let it flow out. You just had to go find it where it was just naturally coming out to represent, again, the free-flowing humility that the Holy Spirit will cause us to experience and to feel, and that free flow of the Holy Spirit in us. It's nothing that has to be conjured up. There's also cinnamon in this oil. It smells so good. And that represents boldness. And I didn't know this about cinnamon, but they're almost like a a dandelion leaf leaf, um, or seed. I mean, I don't know about you, but the dandelions are winning right now. And and they blow, and they got these little parachutes on them. And And cinnamon has the same kind of seed. And what's interesting about cinnamon is it doesn't matter where that seed lands. It takes root. I mean, it's almost incredible, like a dandelion that can grow anywhere. But uh, it, it just represents that no matter where we land, when we've got the Holy Spirit with us, we can be in some pretty dark places, uh, some pretty awful places, and we're still going to sprout and live and thrive. That's what that represents. Calamus is also in that oil, and that represents healing. A calamus is actually like a cortisone that has a broad spectrum of healing elements in it, which is, again, the Holy Spirit in our lives has this broad spectrum of effects it has of our, in our body, in our soul, in our spirit. There's just this amazing healing that comes when the Holy Spirit comes upon us. Cassia is another element in this oil. It's from the Laurel family, and it represents love. It tastes and it smells sweet. It, I mean, it's just this lovely thing. And, and love is the greatest of the powers that comes from this. We just have this ability to love God, to love people, which will cause us to serve. It fills us. We begin to operate in that love. And then olive oil is the biggest part of it, and that's the thing that kind of ties it all together. It flows very freely within the olive oil, and that represents unity. So there's now a unity when the Holy Spirit is in us with God, and then it also creates this amazing unity among Christ's followers so that we actually become what the Bible describes as one body. And there are many different gifts and many different abilities, but we all work together. It's amazing, and that's what happens when we walk through this door that is called Jesus. Now, I don't know about you, but I've walked through lots of different doors in my life. I walked through some doors, quite honestly, that as I look back, I wish I'd have never even shaken the knob of that door because all it did was open me up to addiction and brokenness and pain. Not only was I hurting myself, but I was hurting just about everybody around me because I said yes to something, walked through a door, embraced something that I thought was going to be awesome, I thought was going to be wonderful, but when I got in there, it did nothing but entangle me in chains and bind me and begin to destroy me. But I also walk through that amazing door that is Jesus and have begun to see over time him just continue to work and to do great things, leading me into joy and into blessing. The reality is that there are doors before all of us. But here's the truth, and I put this on that piece of paper you were handed at the door. There are only two doors. There's a door to life, and there's a door to death. The door to death will present itself in many different forms, in many different doors, to try to lure and to try to please and to try to gratify, but in the end, it leads to death and destruction. And again, many of us have wandered down and through that door and the path that it leads to. The door to life, on the other hand, is one door, It's one way, it's one man, it's Jesus Christ. So here's my question for you this morning. Where do you find yourself? What door do you find yourself entering, pursuing? What pathway are you on? Uh, Grace Green, who's going to South Asia as a missionary for us uh, in June, uh, talked a couple of weeks ago about Jesus saying, I am the light, and where I am, there is no darkness. Uh, Last week, I told you about Jesus saying that I am the way, the truth, and the life. This week, Jesus makes a declaration that I'm the door. And there are three things that I want you to see as I take you through uh, quickly a bunch of scripture and then to that place where he makes that declaration. So here are three things I want you to see. I want you to see in this piece of scripture an introduction, an invitation, and an illumination. 
and Christianity, sometimes we call it revelation. So first we see an introduction. Jesus is going to introduce himself to the people, in particular the religious leaders of the day. We're going to see an invitation where he says to them, I'm the way, come by me. And then the last thing we're going to see is this illumination where we see that faith in Jesus leads us into all of these promises Jesus says that are here for us and for those of us that will follow. So here's the background of all these stories because it's through several uh, chapters of the book of John. Jesus is having a dialogue with the religious leaders. They're called Pharisees. And then his followers are sitting there listening to this whole thing. And Jesus says to them, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So his disciples are trying to figure out what Jesus is talking about. But immediately the religious leaders are just fired up mad. Because they don't think they're in bondage to anything. They are children of Abraham. The Jews have this high esteem of themselves because they are God's chosen people and they know it. They aren't in bondage. Our father is God. We come from the line of Abraham. That's what they're thinking. And as they're thinking that and actually verbalizing it, Jesus says to them, if, if God were your father, you would love me. You are of your father, the devil. Oh my gosh, talk about picking a fight. I mean, can you imagine? I mean, it happens when we fight. We say awful things and we know immediately that one's going to hurt. And that's what happens here. So imagine what they're going. Jesus is calling them out and he's saying, you, you aren't from God. You aren't from Abraham. You're from the devil. And again, A few moments later, he says to them, "If I was there before Abraham. So again, he's just blowing their minds because he's just declaring over and over and over again, I'm God. I'm the son of God. I am God. I and the father are one. So then as the story continues through these chapters, a blind man is there. He's been blind from birth. He's never been able to see. Jesus heals him and the city goes crazy. So much so that the Pharisees, the religious leaders, actually pull him aside, make him stand in front of all of them and say, who did this to you? What happened to you? And the blind man who would naturally have to do this said, you know what? Jesus did this for me. He healed me. And they are just upset, throwing all kinds of questions and accusations against this blind man. And it gets to the place where, again, this guy's been healed. They should be rejoicing, but they actually excommunicate this healed blind man. They throw him out of their community. They reject him. So while all of that is happening and you see what's being stirred up, Jesus kind of shifts the conversation to start saying, you know, I'm the good shepherd and I, my sheep know my voice. He starts talking in terms of sheep and shepherds. And he just says to them, you cannot enter into my sheep pen uh, unless you come through me. And, and if you do any other thing, you just are thieves and robbers. So not only has he told the religious leaders that they are, their father's the devil, he's now telling them that they're, bo- they're all thieves and robbers. So again, he's just painting this picture of who they are and who he is. And that's where we come to the I am statement. Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. All of the things that I told you that I would show you are in this particular verse. He's repeating this imagery. He stands before the religious leaders, and he's being bold. He's telling them like it is, I am the door. He's saying, in light of your anger, in light of what I've called you the devil's sons, uh, in light of calling you blind, I mean, uh, thieves and robbers, I am the light. Let me introduce myself to you. I am the door. So that's the beginning. He says, I am the door. And why is this such a big deal? Why do they get so upset? Well, the reality of this day and time is that these religious leaders considered themselves the door. 
They were what they called the gatekeepers. You didn't come in and out of relationship with God except right through them. They were the ones that you had to walk through. They were the gatekeepers. They took care of the religious things. And, and Jesus is just telling them, I am the date, He's the door. He steps in. He calls them out. He's saying, I trump you. You are not who you think you are. I am the door. So again, understand what's going on, but understand the tragedy of this situation. Because the tragedy of this situation is that Jesus is standing right before them and they won't accept him. These religious leaders cared more about their own power than the power of God. They cared more about the glory that they received from their position than the glory of God. They cared more more about controlling and controlling their own lives uh, than they cared about God being in control. They cared about their ways, not the ways of God. Their will, not God's will. And again, as I look around, as I navigate my own life, I often battle in these same places and I watch humanity do the same thing. We care for more for our own systems. We care more for our own way of doing things than we do about the gospel of Jesus Christ and what he came to do and desires for us. In essence, we continue to walk through the doors that lead us to darkness. So again, Jesus introduces himself to these Pharisees and says, I'm the door. You come through this door frame and there's love. You come through this door frame and there's grace. In Ephesians it says, for by grace you've been saved. You come through through this door frame and there's mercy. Again in Ephesians, but God who is rich in mercy. Through this you will find that. Through this door frame you will find forgiveness of your sins. In whom there ha- we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin is what it says in Colossians. If you come through this door frame, open this door, there's peace, there's joy, there's patience, which are all listed in the fruits of the Spirit that we get. That thing that I said was in the anointing oil. Those things are what we get. So here's what I think I want you to understand. Jesus Christ is the only way into a relationship with God. Jesus Christ is the only way to life and to life eternal. And Jesus Christ is the only way by which we may be forgiven of our sins. That's the foundation of Christianity. And it is lived out 10 chapters later in the book of John when Jesus Christ goes to the cross absorbing the wrath of God for us so that we won't have to experience it so that we can walk through in the song we sang and this is true in the in the stories of the gospel when Jesus died the curtain that separated humanity from God in the temple was actually torn from the top to the bottom an impossible feat for any human hands to do was torn so that it represents and again a symbol of us being able to go into the presence of God Jesus Christ is the door. And when we miss the door, we continue to walk in darkness. We continue to walk in the lies that the world is trying to teach us and say to us that will bring us life. They won't bring us life. We continue to walk in these false hopes that a culture will try to promise us. Jesus is the door to life. Jesus is the door to hope. He is the way through this relationship with a holy and righteous God. So he goes on to say, I'm the door, but he continues, if anyone enters through me. And here's the conditional piece of this, and please hear this. There is a condition placed upon us, and that condition is that you have to enter through him. You have to enter through Jesus. That's the conditional clause. And that's his invitation to the religious leaders that he's speaking to. Come through me. He stands before them. Enter through me. It's an invitation. But again, the Pharisees miss it. And here's, I think, our reality. We can miss it. We keep entering other doors. We keep thinking something else is going to satisfy us. We keep pursuing things that will not give us life. We will actually end up finding death and darkness. The Bible describes them as idols, and it says that we will wrestle with them. And I think we do wrestle with them. We wrestle with the idol of power. I want to control my own life. 
We, we, enter, uh, we, we wrestle with the power of success. I want to choose the path that I will walk down. There's this sense that God's gonna just steal things from us. So we keep thinking, I will find my own path to success. And we can put people in the place of what's impo- most important to us. It can be our spouse. Uh, it could be our children. And we find all kinds of things that we pursue, that we chase, that we put on a pedestal. They become the things that we think are gonna satisfy us, and they never do. Jesus began, as, as he was talking about, about the sheep. And he's saying to them, I'm the good shepherd. I'm going to care for you. You can trust me. I'm going to take you. Come by me. I love my sheep. I will take care of them. And if you know anything about sheep, uh, we have a family that's one of the last large sheep herding families in the, in the region. Uh, they were here in the first service. And, and I've talked to them. Uh, the only thing I know about Sheep is that it's pretty good to eat. It's good eating. I like lamb. But, but sheep are dumb. They are just incredibly, they will walk off a cliff as if they're jumping into a swimming pool. I mean, they just are that dumb. They need guidance. And, and that's what Jesus is saying about us. You know what? You really do, whether you believe it or not, you need my guidance. You need me to lead you to the places that, are, that there is life. That's what you need. So there's something encouraging in this story, and here's what it is. In Jesus Christ, there's hope. There's this sweet invitation for you, an invitation to freedom, an invitation to hope, an invitation to life, and that life goes on for eternity. That's the invitation to come to Jesus. And the awesome thing about Jesus being the door, the door, the door, is that the chains that enslave us, the sin that consumes us, the death that invades us, the fear that can overwhelm us, cannot go through the door with us. Isn't that awesome? Man, you just come to Jesus and all of that stuff is taken care of. Those are the promises, and that's the illumination, the last piece of this. This introduction, he's standing there saying, I'm the door. This invitation, if you come through me, and then this illumination, he's saying, he will be saved, and he will go in and out and find pasture. A good shepherd is always taking his sheep to better and better pasture to better places. And the first promise that Jesus gives us as we enter the door is salvation. He says, but God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. So there's salvation. We can step into this relationship where we will actually dwell with him. The spirit of God comes and enters us. We get baptized in the Holy Spirit and we get overwhelmed with the power and we begin to see sin and death, the devil destroyed by the work of God. The people first began to be called Christians because they began to recognize in these people they look like Jesus. And that's what happens to us even these thousands of years Later, we will find pasture, and it goes on from there. He promises to meet all of our needs. This is how he says it. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. So he begins to meet our needs. And here's what I want you to understand, because this is, I think, a little confusing at times. It doesn't mean he's going to give everything to you that you want. So this isn't a self-help program where you get everything that you want. Everything you desire, that might not happen. But here's what's important to understand. His declaration to you is that he's a good shepherd and he knows what you need. And he's going to give you absolutely everything that you need for life and for happiness. The shepherd knows the flock and because the shepherd knows the sheep individually, by name, each and every one of us, Jesus Christ will supply every need that we have in Christ 
And that should be incredibly freeing for all of us. For all of us. We're going to find pasture. He's going to lead us to good things. And we are going to love it. And again, as I've wandered now for almost 30 years through this thing called Christianity, I can stand before you and say that is absolutely true. Absolutely true. And the people that I hang with that are chasing with me, uh, they're experiencing that too. And we're constantly trying to get others to recognize and to realize this is real. This isn't make-believe stuff. This isn't, some, this isn't a fantasy. This is real. Jesus is the door. We come in through an invitation and we receive all that he has for us. You know, God's word for perfection and what he provides for us is shalom. Uh, a Hebrew word that means harmony, it means peace, it means this holistic well-being. So there's this sense when you get into the presence of God that, man, everything I need is taken care of. Everything I need. And we need that holistic well-being, and he promises us that. That's what he does. He reconciles us to God. He reconciles us to each other, and he pours out this incredible blessing on us, which allows us to walk through seasons of devastation and seasons of despair and seasons of death and mourning and still stand upright and be strong through the midst of it. So again, as I close, there are only two doors. There's the door to life and there's the door to death. Where do you find yourself this morning? Entering through the door of Jesus, entering into the light that Jesus promises us where there is no dark spaces. We can feast on that bread of life. We can recognize and realize the good that he promises. So walk through that door. And I want to suggest to you something today, and I'm going to pray in just a second. You know, some of us walk through those doors or that door, and then we drift And we end up in these places where we don't even really know how we got here, but we realize, you know what? I'm not really following Jesus like I did back then. And I miss that. I long for that. I want to encourage you. It's the same simple prayer that we pray to open the door that gets us right back in the right place again. So join me as I pray and close. Lord Jesus, I want to thank you that you are the door. And Lord, your word tells us that you actually stand at the door to our life and you knock. And if we'll open that door, that you'll come in. Well, I think the invitation, Lord, for us today is to recognize that you're the door and to walk through and into your presence. So my prayer for myself personally today and for everyone in this room is that I would recognize that door and that I would walk through and that I would dine with you, that I'd allow you, Holy Spirit, to do everything and anything that you want to do in me. Have your way today. You know, as heads are bowed and eyes are closed, here's the first thing I'm going to ask you to do as a response to what you've heard. If your heart today is that you would be through that door and that Jesus would just have his way for, with you. Um, again, heads are bowed and eyes are closed. This isn't a look around time. But if that's your desire, if that's your heart this morning, maybe you've wandered away, maybe you've drifted away, maybe you're not as solid in your commitment as you felt, feel like you should be and you want to be back in that right place, you want to walk back through that door again today, would you just lift your hand and say, that's me. I want to be in that place. Lord, you see these lifted hands. I pray, Lord, you will powerfully uh, come. Uh, You know the situation of every lifted hand. You know everything about them. They are your sheep. You know them by name. You know what's going on in their life. Uh, I pray, Lord God, reveal, speak, Holy Spirit, speak in powerful ways to these hearts and to these minds that they might be exactly what they want to be, and that is in your presence. You can put your hands down. You might have walked in here today and have yet to say yes to Jesus. I want to give you that opportunity today. So again, as heads are bowed and eyes are closed, uh, you might not have ever said yes to Jesus, but you recognize today that he's the door and you want to walk through that door. Would you lift your hand 
and say, that's me. I absolutely want to take that step. I see that hand. That's awesome. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Not a time to look around, just to acknowledge what you want. Yeah, I see that hand. That's good. That is good. Well, because we just like to do life together around here, we're all going to pray out loud. Uh, honestly, for those of us that feel like we might have drifted away, this prayer puts you right back uh, where you need to be. So let's just pray together, everybody. And those of you who lifted your hand, this is how simple it is to walk through that door. A simple little prayer. So pray with me. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, you're the door. I recognize that today, and I walk through. And I ask you, Lord, I ask you, Jesus, to fill me with your presence, to forgive me of my sin, to cleanse me of all unrighteousness, to heal me of all brokenness, and set my feet in the pasture you want me in. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, let's applaud those that made that decision.